Um, <coughs> Jeff, it is such a pleasure to be with you in your home. I'm completely honored. I've seen you on the, on the docks here and there. I've seen what you've done over the years, and people have spoken about you. You know, your uh, Jose's last show obviously was with you. I'd love to speak to you about that at some point, but I'd like to get this whole thing started by passion. You know, we were talking about your life and my life and, and how invested you were as a surfer and now fishing and the evolution of our lives, the evolution of the ocean over here and what you're seeing and what you saw in the past. You know, let's start back a little bit and tell me about your youth and your childhood and, you know, your surfing. So more or less, you know, grew up here in Naples. Right off the bat, I was swinging from a sailboat mast with my dad in a, in a bassinet, you know, before I could even walk. Did they live on a sailboat? No, they didn't. They lived here in Naples, mm -hmm. but they, my dad, he liked to sail. He loved the ocean. You know, he never fished or anything like that, but I think that's where I got it from. The beach is a mile away from here. This is where we would go on the weekends and stuff. So I grew up on the beach. Right. And of course, first was fishing. Um, loved to fish. You know, there's a little pond right here behind the house. I used to walk out there and catch bass and everything. And uh, I'd go down to the beach with my parents, and there was a you know a 20 foot jetty of rocks and be snook and snapper and stuff around. And just that was me all day long until I got you know called in to come home. Right. You know, I was that last generation that played till the streetlights were on. You know, gotta get home before streetlights come on. You're in trouble. How yeah. old are you? I just turned 50. Yeah. Over the hill now. <laughs> What's that say about me? I don't know. <laughs> One foot in the grave. You've been over the hill for 30 years. <laughs> Enjoying every minute of it. You did know? your dad get you into fishing or was that what a bunch of kids did? You know, my dad did not. Um, I think it was my father's father who got me into fishing a little bit. Um, he used to go fishing off the land, you know, right off of 92, going into Goodland and, you know, catching redfish with shrimp and stuff like that. And uh, my mother's parents were from the Northeast in Connecticut, and he was a major outdoors fisherman. And every summer we'd go up there, I would go fishing these little cobblestone creeks and stuff. And it was the first chance, like, I could really see in the water, and I'd be chasing sunfish and stuff. And I can remember my grandfather, like, eight or nine years old, he came in yelling at me and my brother because I was messing up his spinning rods. So he gave me a fly rod instead. He goes, here, he goes, hey, quit messing up my tackle. Was he a fly fisherman? He was. You know, everybody in the Northeast, trout fisherman, you know. Right. So he, he gave me the fly rod, and I kind of started dabbling around in it back then. I didn't really take it serious, but the one thing that I really loved about up there compared to, like, the end of the lakes in Florida, you can't see in the water. Mm -hmm. you know, but up there, I could see everything. And I just, I just got this attraction of, of seeing a particular fish, and I want to catch that fish. You know, I'd see a pickerel. We don't have them down here. I want to catch one of those. And I think that's where my sight fishing started. It was more hunting was young, than fishing. It was hunting, uh -huh. you know. And then, you know, the older I get, you know, the 10, 11 years old, you get the trust from your parents, you get on a bike, and, you know, and start going across the street here and start dabbling in the salt water. Before you know it, I had a, a, a canoe there's a little body of water out here called Clams Pass. It's a beautiful little backcountry system, connects to the beach, and uh, you know it has everything snook and reds. And growing up around here, there wasn't a lot of fly fishing. You know, it was all plug fishing, snook and reds, and that's pretty much what everybody did around here: throwing the mirror lures, yeah. you know, the treble hooks, and everything amongst the mangroves. And uh, that's just what everybody did. And uh, you know, it, it was a wonderful little place. I could ride my bike to the canoe, you know. It, I'd have to beg one of my friends to go with me until I found somebody who liked to fish. And then before you know it, we were down there every day in a canoe. I'm pulling the guy, pushing the guy around, you know, we're fishing. And and uh, that, that was pretty much every day growing up here, you know, trying to catch a fish in a particular way. Right. You know. Was it a prerequisite that your parents, that you had somebody else to go with you in the canoe fishing? Or would they allow you to go alone? At first, they didn't know. I didn't tell them that I had a canoe because I got it from an older buddy. <laughs> and it was stashed down here at, at this little venue over here. There's a hotel there now, but there used to be little canoe racks. And I would just keep it down there, and I'd stash my paddle in the bushes. And, you know, I was just supposed to be in the neighborhood. 
and I wasn't supposed to be out and about. You know, what do they know? They're busy. My dad's working all the time. My mom's dealing with my little brother, you know, and I'm just getting lost in a canoe, you know, right. trying to chase fish and just get away. When I when I look back at my life, some of the best years were when I was similar, probably in your, at, at the time that you were doing this, I was like seven, no, I was probably like eight, nine, and 10. You might have been a little bit younger. I learned how to tie flies right around then. And every day I was on the river at some point with a bike and a baseball mitt on my handlebars because I would go to baseball practice at like noon or two and I'd go to the river till dark and, and fish. And I don't think that Nobody knew that it was dangerous to be on the river. I mean, sure, I could have fallen in right. and been swept downstream, but, right. you know, it was just, that's what we did. You don't think and, about it. Yeah, and you had a playground here on the water in a canoe. My playground was the rivers of Aspen and baseball and stuff, but uh, I feel sorry for the for the kids of today where they don't even think about going to a river and having fun catching fish or to uh, the edge of an ocean somewhere. And, you know, it's, it's funny you say that. Like, I feel like I'm that, at my age, I feel like I'm the last generation that got to go out and play and all that. I had my first, my son, when I was 22 years old. I think it was uh, 90, 90 something. But it got to the point to where I didn't feel safe letting my kids go run around crazy like I used to at that time. Like, my kids kind of, got into that, you know, they were into their video games and stuff like that. Everybody was in the house. Like my house was the house where everybody came to, Right. you know? And uh, I, I felt safe with them there. You know, this was the time when you hear of little girls getting kidnapped out of their front yard, you know? It just, it wasn't the same. Right. You know? And, if they had wanted to be out there in a canoe, would have you let them? My youngest was like that. Yeah. The tadpole. Yeah, she really loved the outdoors. The other two didn't get it. I don't know if dad pushed it too hard, maybe. And dad was doing it kind of like, you know, the hard way, the artificial way, you know, where I'm not catching boatloads of fish, you know. Right. And, you know, I've come to realize you either got the bug or you don't. I agree. You know. Did so, you call her Tadbo? Tadpole? tadpole? Yeah, she's still my tadpole. You still call her Tadpole? Yeah. How old is she now? 23. Awesome. Yeah. Really cool. So you started, that, so fly fishing or fishing in general was your first hobby. It wasn't skateboarding or surfing? Or no. Surfing came into my life probably like middle school, 13, 14 years old. Were you a rebel? Oh, yeah. What kind? What did that mean, rebel? What did you do to earn the right to be called or known as a rebel? You know, somebody's telling me I can't do this or that. Like... Growing up in Naples, it used to be nothing. Senior citizen and shuffleboard courts, we can go anywhere we wanted. It started getting popular. Population started growing. These childhood haunts that we would go to started getting pushed out. Kind of, you know, who are you to tell me I got to leave? I was here first. You know, does that does, that, does, does you know, that translate to your fishing today? I think it does. It does. You know, it, once I got into the surfing as well, it was it's very tribal. You know, senior, like it, here at Naples Pier, we don't get a lot of waves. Right. Um, but when we did, you know, that was where everybody went. And of course, you had the older guys who were really good at it. And, you know, you had to fight for position, you know, to get on the inside. And then right. you, know, you had, you claimed the wave. But, you know, with the big guys around, you had to fight for scraps. So right? there's, a, there's a hierarchy there's system. There's a hierarchy, exactly. Right. You know, you had to respect your peers. Is that is that throughout the world of surfing? Because I know it's big time in Hawaii. It is. It's uh, especially in Hawaii. Yeah. It's very tribal. You know, right. if you look at the history of surfing, you know, everywhere you go, Hawaii, California, they all have their own certain breaks. And in those breaks, you're like, you have your neighborhood kids, and, you know, that's their break, and that's where they go. Outsiders are to come in and be like, hey, who's that? Go to, Sometimes it's go not to that a problem. Break. You know, if the guys were respectful and they didn't try jumping in front of you and you're waving, they kind of just worked their way in. You gave them the same respect. Right. You know, but they come in, you know, pushing you aside and trying to do whatever they want at your house. <laughs> it doesn't work like that here. Did you stop fishing for that period of time and, and, and go to, to surfing full time? Or were you doing both? I was doing both. I was just... just Part but, of the water. Well, when the you waves know, are here, it, you surf. Exactly. When the and, and fishing here, is right, there's not much you surfing. Fish. You know, yeah. so there's more fishing than surfing. Right. But at the same time, you know, I'm getting to be 15, 16 years old, 
And, you know, girls got into the picture. For sure. Didn't see a lot of them out in the mangroves, <laughs> you know. But when you were surfing. <laughs> they were there they on the were beach. everywhere. Yeah, you everywhere. Know? So those teenage years, you're chasing girls. And the fishing kind of took a little bit of a, a backseat, you right. know. But I never put it down, you know. We used to go out to the parties and whatnot, you know. And everybody would be going home. And, like, you look at your buddy. He's all jacked up. He's like, let's go, let's go fish the lights, you know. You know, we go fishing for Snooker Jacks in the middle of the night, you know, and lighted docks and stuff, you know. Wow. It, what we're a... Always doing it, you know. Like when I was a kid, I would get so hung up on it. I would get so fired up in the summertime. Like I would wait for my parents to go to sleep. <laughs> and I would sneak out as soon as they went to bed. And I would go down to the canals down here. And I would fish all night long. Snook would be popping in the lights, you know, you see them. And back then, once again, Fly fishing wasn't a big thing. You didn't have all the choices of rods and whatnot, like what we have today. You had Fenwick stuff, you know, maybe a few Orvis things, but you, you, there was no fly shops or anything like that. So we were throwing like, you know, golden eyes and you know, treble hooks and stuff. And you'd catch one fish a light and then they'd stop eating the plug. But yeah, then you sit there and they're just popping, you're popping, and you just watch it. And like, you, know, you get kind of pissed, so you go to the next light and catch one, and that was it. And I would catch myself. Just sitting there and not fishing and just watching. And I'd see these little tiny pilchards come through the light and they come up and eat them. And I'm thinking to myself, man, I need a lure that small. That's what they're feeding on, you know? And then here came the fly fishing. A little bit of white marabou on a hook. That was it. Throw it out there, just tickle it through. The snook would eat it all night long. And you'd catch one after another. So you, I'm just ate up with it. I got it all figured out. Catch fish after fish. And look towards the east, and I can see the lights in the light of the sky. I was like, oh, shit. I could get home back in bed before my parents wake up. <laughs> you know, and I would do this quite a bit, you know. And I was just ate up. I couldn't get enough. Right. You so know? you weren't just fishing. You were hooked. You were designing your own flies. You were yeah, trying to figure out new patterns. I'm, I'm not going to say, you know, like, I'm designing my own flies. Well, I you just were, need you to were make something that looked like a little yeah. pilchard, you know. D during this time, did you... Were, you know, were you familiar with Lefty Cray, Joe Brooks, Stu Apt, any of these guys? Yeah, I was eight up. Everything that I could read about, you know, your dad and Lefty Cray. And Me? Yeah, you were in there. Oh, <laughs> I mean, anything that I could read, I was sucking it up. Wow. And it kind of shaped me up into the guy that I am today. Like, I read about what you guys had in the Keys, the clear water sight fishing and stuff. And around here, we, we have it, mm -hmm. but it's not the Keys. Right. You know what I mean? But I would catch myself wanting to be in that scenario to where I'm constantly sight fishing. Hunting. I'm constantly hunting, looking for clean water to fish. I'd rather catch a 20-inch snook that I sight fish. Crystal clear water. Not crystal clear, but you know, right. clear water. Than blind casting a 30-inch off the bank. You know? And I know to this day it's a kink in my armor, in my game. Like, since the freeze of 210, I don't see the big, giant snook in the shallows like I used to. Not that they're not there, but, like, the numbers aren't there like they right. used to be, you know? If I want to go catch a big snook, it, it involves finding a good current swept wall, bait running down it, you know, three to five foot of water. Everglades looks like Coca-Cola. It's pretty dark, you know? And, right. I can only hold the bow for so long unless somebody just pitch fly after fly. And you catch some big ones that way, but a lot of times you're working hard for a long time with little results, you know? So it just, my ADD won't allow me to do it. I right. need to go hunt something. Right. You know, I make a, a living chasing down, you know, redfish by the year. They go shallow, you know, backs are out of the water, they're tailing, you know, they're easy for my clients to catch. Um, you know, of course, when our little tarpon season comes in, I'm, I'm totally hung up on that, you know, because it's the only seasonal thing we have. Everything else is year-round, you know. So I'll switch gears and go crazy for those big silver guys for as long as I can. Did you ever think about going down and guiding in the Keys? Or was no. it goes back to that surfer that's their territory? It, in a way like that. But, you know, I remember... Yeah, I knew a lot of guys before I was a guide, and I'd hear them bitch about things people coming in and stuff like that, you know, and yeah, I don't want to step on any toes. Even when I learned how to guide, I was just sneaking in here and there and trying to creep in and do my day and get out, you know. I knew where my peers fished and I wouldn't go there, you know. 
just too much respect. Back then, Everglades City, you know, the 90s, 2000, you went the wrong spot, the wrong guy. You never knew who was waiting at the ramp when you got back. What kind of repercussions were you seeing? I mean, I've heard stories. Right. You know, I've seen bricks through windshields. I've seen, uh, I heard, you know, yeah, the story. Couple little beat downs here and there, you know. Yeah, you know, that's, that's a long time ago. You can't do that stuff anymore. No, you know, but no. But there was a big problem in the Keys when the new guys from Fort Lauderdale used to right. go down. Mark Croca, you know, right. speaks about that where your tires are flattened, et cetera. Yeah, I mean, everybody say those are good old boys. It was an you know interesting. What I mean? That's a that's a different breed. Knit. That's like the last of the Wild West. Yeah, it's still to this day, it's you know, the whole nation shuts down for COVID. Everglades did. He's still open and going. Right. You know, it brought so much traffic here. Because the keys were locked. We just spoke keys about were locked that. locked down. That's you right. Know, you, uh, and we were the only guys open. And everybody knew about it to the point where so much traffic was coming over here that the sheriff closed down a lane one day and just act like they're doing safety checks on everybody coming into the ramp and just to see where they're all coming from. 80, 90% was from Broward, Dade County. You know, but once again, Everglades City just wild west mm -hmm. yeah we're still open come on there's no city ramps there's no county ramps they're all little privately owned so they can get away with it you know the older i've gotten um i really quite often think about how much i miss innocence mm -hmm. because with wisdom and miles and mileage and all the traveling i've done all over the world through skiing and fishing and whatnot, being married three times and raising three kids, there's nothing new. So, and we understand the repercussions of mistakes made. And I miss those younger years on that bike, riding to the river. You didn't know if you got home late for dinner, or whatever, but simp simplicity. And you didn't know what was gonna happen the next week. And you didn't really care. Right. Cause you're living so, day to day in the moment and the older I've gotten there's so many things that eliminate that that state of mind at this age and I miss that but one of the things that I love about fishing is that I know when I leave the dock there's something that really cool could take place and most likely I've seen it again but the rest of the world goes away For me, as soon as I get to Everglades City, my AT&T does not work anymore. I cannot take your phone call in the parking lot if you can't find the ramp. My phone doesn't ring on the water, and I get to go 10 hours a day with no outside stress. I'm in the Everglades. It's pretty quiet. I get to get away. It's been my sanctuary, my safety since I was a young parent. Right. They kept me alive. You know what I mean? It was my escape. It's kind of like you said, it's getting hard now, you know? I, I go out and there's a constant buzz of boats going around. It, it's not as tranquil as it used to be, right. you know? You're losing, you're losing that special little slice of heaven out there. And the funny thing is I try fighting it. Yeah. I try standing up and st not stopping, I can't stop it, but I don't want to let go of that special place. I, I don't want to give it up. You it know? is still special. It's just different. It's just different. But we are losing it one little boat, one little chip at a time. Little and I hate to be dour because this is a wonderful world that we live in. We bow hunt for elk. We get to go out on the ocean and catch these monsters with fly rods, you know. Um, and with that said, I just try not to look at the stuff that has been happening over the last number of years and just still enjoy that one fish, that one bite, that boat ride, that one special morning. You know, to this morning, every single day, I leave that dock. And that's it. Brand new. I still, still pull the phone out of my pocket every morning. I take pictures of the sunrise. What I'm going to do with the picture, I don't know. Right. But it's so perfect. It's so beautiful. It's such a perfect moment in time. It's like, I got to capture that. I can't bring it home. I show Christine what I saw this morning. You know, there's so many people out in the world that don't see what we see. Right. I saw a couple tarpon today blowing up on glass minnows. Water looks like chocolate milk. Can't see a fish for nothing. 
but I have a guy from Pennsylvania. Never seen that before. And he couldn't believe that I was in 15 inches of water and there's 50, 60 pound tarp blowing up on these minnows. And he can't see them. They're gone. <laughs> and he's it, just driving them nuts. But, you know, we didn't catch any. We didn't get any right. bites. So you were there. We were there and he's like, you know, I didn't catch one. But man, just to see that going on. People don't know. People, people don't witness things like this. No. They don't know what it's like to be out there and see a big crocodile on the bank. See a crocodile on the bank. You know, this 50 pound fish is jumping and slapping the water and it's echoing through the trees. Right. You hear a pop from a snook around the corner and just it echoes. Right. But are you, but you do that every day and you see and hear that every day. Are you still excited about that or is your excitement because of your client's excitement? No, it's mine. Every time we go fishing, these guys on the front of the boat, they're just doing the work for me. I'm going fishing. Right. This is where I think it's going to yeah, be the best. And you're catching fish and, and through them. Exactly. Yeah. You know, and I want you to fish it like this. Because that, like this works. This works. Yeah. You know. Yeah. Here, we don't get that caliber of clientele that like comes down for, you know, a whole season. Fishing 50 days, you know, through a stretch, you know. Right. Most of the clientele is, you know, people coming down for visit family they're here for a day or two you know right. and it, it it's a tough game you know for people who don't do it you and know? you probably have got to be on the phone a fair amount and on the internet or wherever you drum up new business because your clientele you know uh changes all the time all the time and i'm constantly people ask me all the time well i'm sure you have just regulars well, I do have a lot of great regulars, but I still take on new business yeah. every day. How do how what kind of a challenge is that for you? And, and how do you how do you uh, market yourself and and get new business? Like you were saying earlier, I'm not the most techie savvy guy. Thank God Instagram's easy, and that's pretty much all I do for my own business. They find you in the Instagram. They find me through the Instagram. You know, it it helped. You know, being invited with Will Benson and those guys and getting involved doing the world angling films, you know, which introduced me and opened this market up to where I had the pleasure of crossing paths with Jose Wahebi, mm -hmm. crossing paths with you at the Hell's Bay Rendezvous, iCast, you know, and you just start to meet these people and you like, you realize like, man, if I lived in town or in the same town he did, we'd be hanging out, you know, just, you notice that even though we're all from different parts, right? Birds of a feather flock together. It's an easy magnetism. It's just what Jose would say is good synergy. It's easy. You don't have to right. try. Just two common minds. They all come together. Yeah. You know. And how did you make that transformation from surfing to guiding full time? And was that difficult? From surfing to guiding. I mean, did you even ever want to be a pro surfer? Uh, of course I did, but that was that was. Pipe not, dream. not even yeah, it's a pipe yeah. dream. It was just me wanting to do it, and, you know, little local competitions and stuff You're like that. Hot, you just, hot shit, not really. On a small you island. know, I just, <laughs> you know, I just like to do it. Yeah, you know, I like the competition. I like self competition. I don't want to rely on anybody else. I'm the one that messed up. I'm the one that fell off the wave. You know, that's what I really enjoyed about the surfing. It was a way for me to express myself. Yeah, you know. And, and what point in time were you sent, were you thinking I can do this? You know, I can be a full time guide. That came later. At the time, I had a construction company. I had a pretty good. I mean, it was small. I was a subcontractor, but I was making pretty good money. I was a young parent, trying to you know, do it. Every other parent trying to support you know, living week to week and doing it. And at the time, you know, this is probably. Uh, let's say 97, 98, there wasn't much of a, a guiding business here aside from like, uh, like the tourist toting trips, you know, the big head boats, you know, go offshore, catch some lady fish in the channel and they come back, you know? Right. And then I would say probably, you know, 98, 99, it started catching on the river ran through it whenever that came out. That you know, kind of, everybody says that. I mean, I saw that. I saw that in Colorado, yeah. but it really it made a big difference. Was Everybody omnipresent. Wanted, yes, it anywhere started. there was water, people wanted to fly fish. Unbelievable. 
It's crazy. You know, all the... Damn that Robert Redford. <laughs> you know? I want to do a it, podcast. It, 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 it might have been as bad. It might have been know? a blessing for Jeff. That's right. what he's saying. Yeah. yeah. I mean, that for a lot of people. It got, you know, got people into it. For sure. You know? The problem was, like, you didn't have... The Everglades didn't have the, the fly fishing draw. You know? People speak up. The Everglades. Everglades are bass bugs and alligators. You know, Perfect. Like what's in the Everglades, you know? And, and it's pretty good. But like the Keys stole the spotlight. Bonefish, the tarpon, the crystal clear water, you know, these fish coming in and bouncing off of banks. and The sea fans, the coral heads. Beautiful. Yeah. It's appealing, you know? Right. You don't have to catch a fish. You have to watch them come down at lean water. You're hooked. I'll see you next year. You know? Right. They come here and it's, it's a little different, you know? Um, so I'm doing construction and you know I'm, I'm fishing every chance i can on the weekends and whatnot any chance i can get away and you know i'm hanging out the fly shop i know the fly guy uh the, the owner of the shop and we kind of got put together uh in a fishing tournament through a new up-and-coming guide he was a friend at the time and he asked me to join him fish the tournament so i i met Tom Shatley, the owner of our local fly shop down here, ended up uh, pretty much becoming like a mentor to me. Took me underneath his wing. You know, we hit it off right off the bat. Taught me how to tie flies real well. You know, taught me how to improve my casting. You know, every aspect of the game, you know. And uh, I was working. He's like, well, how come you don't guide? I'm like, I can't afford a boat right now. You know, I got two kids, you know, trying to come up, you know, just trying to make ends meet. And, uh, you know, I was always coming every weekend, like, really, really, you know, bragging these pictures of fish and whatnot, you know, just shooting the shit with the guys at the fly shop. And one of the guys that worked there inherited some money. And he said to me, he goes, hey, if I get a boat, you get your captain's license? I'm like, yeah, sure, no problem. Didn't think anything of it, you know. Six months later, the guy's like, okay, got the boat, you get your license. I was like, holy shit, I gotta go take my captain's license now. So when got my captain's license, I started working with this guy. I started running like offshore trips, you know, a lot of bait fishing trips. Um, when I could get the fly fishing clientele, I would take them offshore and I would go fly fishing. I would go behind the shrimp boats, chum up wrecks, you know, stuff like that. No one did it around. The only person that I knew was like RT down in the Keys. Right. I read everything I could find about RT. And what are you catching? Groupers things. and kingfish? If I went behind the shrimp boats, false albacore, black tuna, Kobe would come up, you know. How far offshore are you? 20 to 30 miles. And Dude. it's only 50, 60 foot of water. Yeah, it's not that Very, bad. very shallow. Yeah. You know. Um, but nobody did it. You know, I got a couple fishing clubs. And I'd generate some work doing that. And uh, it, it was a fine line between having the right day to get out there with the weather. The time of year was in the winter time, cold fronts come in, couldn't get out there. So it was a hard business to kind of really keep going. But it was fun and it was different and no one else was doing it, but it just, it didn't kick off. Right. You know? The whole time I'm doing this, I'm working for somebody else, which is cool. It got me in the game. I'm doing what I'd love to do. But I'm offshore doing this. If I can't do this, I have to go in and I got to take these guys bait fishing, you know, and I got to do these things that I don't really want to do. I want to go fly fishing. I want to go back to my roots. I want to go back in the inside. I want to go shallow. And uh, I did that for about five years. And I made the transition to where I could pick up enough trips. After the trip, I'd go and get my guys all set up. They'd, you know, get the jobs going and the next day I'd try to do the same thing and I'd keep flip flopping back and forth. 2005, 2006 comes around where the depression starts and, you know, the business, the construction business starts to slow down. And it was a perfect time for me to make that transition into just being a full-time guide. So I'd say about 2005, 2006, I came across an old guy selling an old waterman, an old whip ray. He was like 84 years old. It was a 2000 whip ray and it was just pretty beat to death. And uh, just, he was getting rid of it. He couldn't use it anymore. It was too small for him. He's getting too old. 
sold to me for ten thousand dollars so holy cow i got my own boat kind of cut my ties with the one guy went on my own and the rest is history the rest is history you know i had to start all over i had to build up you know the fly clientele a lot of the clientele that i had before with the big boat could take no, yeah. a little boat you know yeah but i was doing what i wanted and you know at that time you know the internet was kind of new just started out you know and i was trying to do anything i could possibly do to try to drum up fly fishing business were you ever worried that it wasn't going to work uh no i wasn't i was going to make it work you know what i mean if i had to go back and do plugs or whatever that's fine you know right but you know it, I, I can remember doing all like little little free fishing reports that I could do to try to get my name out there and do this and that. You <laughs> yeah, know? right. It, 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 it's it the was, growing pain. Yeah, you know, I'm just trying to do whatever I can. Is it pretty know? easy for you now to book out a year? Yes. You got a name now. 21 years doing it. Right. Yeah, it took a while to get there, but. What's the best success story for, for you? Is there, can you put, can you pinpoint that in the world of fishing? It's had be the people I met along the way. I met, I've met some incredible people. Who's the most influential for you? Probably Jose. Right. You know. I mean, let's, I'm let's, just talk about Ho let's talk about Jose. When did you first meet him? When did I first meet him? God, what year was that? You, when, can, you can round it out. I'm going to say 05, 06. Right. Oh six or seven, maybe somewhere in there. At a show somewhere. Once again, I was with Will Benson and Dave Tepper, and we we're shooting one of these little films way before anybody fished Louisiana. And that's we, World Angling. Yes, yeah. we made a film that was called Drum back in the day. This is oh eight, I think, when it was released. Maybe oh seven. When we were there, Jose was shooting a show with Baron Travis Holman. They were like the only guys. Like we were in Hopedale. Mm -hmm. We were the only people there. And the guy who they called, his name was Cappy. He supplied all the Southeast for all the oysters, you know? So it's the end of the day. We came in, uh, Travis and Bear there. Greg Arnold is there. Sure. You know, he's the grand poobah, the marsh, right. you know? He's, yeah, sure, he's, I he's know. the OG, you know? Yeah. And uh, Jose is there filming a show. Holy shit. That's Jose. And I avoided him. I was so starstruck. I would walk around <laughs> the opposite sides of the camp. But your, eye, you your eyeballs never left him. <laughs> Unbelievable. Right. I, and you know what? Just like you know, just like everyone says, he was the most generous, kindest human being in the world. Somehow, one time, he kind of cornered me, sat down next to me, started talking to me, introduced himself, and just started talking to me like I've known him my whole life. He wasn't a guy who had the big ego. No, he was He not. wasn't the guy who's been around the world and he's going to tell you how to do it. You know, he's gave you all your attention, you know. Right. When Suggest you looked when you looked him in the eyes, you could see his core. Yes. He he cared. He cared that you that you're there and he cared enough to care about you that he was looking into your eyes yep. he wanted to see you he made everybody feel special he did he just had this he had a great laugh god it was infectious right? i still hear it he was just like to have fun yes. too he didn't take himself too seriously and, and he didn't he used to fly down here just on a whim what do you got going on nothing I'm sure. I'm flying in i'll see you there in 35 minutes right and i pick him up at everglades airport we go fart around, jump fly. back on his plane and go. He loved to fly, right? Loved it. So you fished with him quite a bit. One day is quite a bit. One day is quite one a bit, but yeah, I was blessed. Yeah, I, you were. I mean, we hit it off pretty good. It was easy. Yeah, he was know? a shooting star. He was something else. Yeah, he was. You know, Charismatic he, as hell. He's taught, he taught me a lot. He what showed did, me the ropes a lot. What, you did, know? What, did he, what did he teach you that was most compelling i would say that 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 stuck close to home more than anything else i think to me he showed me what a fishing star should act like and be like 
And there's a lot of fishing stars out there. Lefty was definitely that guy. You know, a flip is that guy. But there are a lot of other egos in the business that think they're bigger than the than the conversation. And see, he was. And he was not. Right. He wasn't. He, he would listen. He would ask you, well, how, how do right. you guys do Right. You know, he's always a student of the game. Mm -hmm. He always wanted to learn. doesn't matter if he knew it all. Someone's talked to him in Key West. He's listening. Well, how do you do it? You know? He's not going to tell you how he does it. Yeah. He wants to learn. It was funny you know? watching his commercials. He'd sit there in, in a yoga pose with his <laughs> legs crossed, you know, rip, rip Paula. I mean, the guy was, he was fucking Zen. sexy, <laughs> zany. <laughs> I mean, he, you know, he dropped those words like synergy. And <laughs> yeah. His, you know, like I used to spend uh, July in the Keys for a long, long time, renting a house, you know, and you know, we'd have him over for dinner or something. And, you know, he'd come up with the fancy salad with the walnuts and the cranberries, <laughs> and, you know, this and that. And, you know, and the way he articulated and talked about things. Yeah. yeah. He was a romantic. He was. He was a romantic. You've seen him on the guitar, you know, passion just flowed through that guy and it didn't matter whether he was you know flying fishing you know his kids yeah he, he was really a, a living example of how to live you know what was that last day of fishing like with him which was a very unfortunate thing and the other question i have with you were you how long were you haunted or if you're still haunted by the fact that the end of that day that you guys fished he ended up uh passing with a terrible plane crash at the airport i'd give up everything to have him back yeah i'd give up my guiding career you know yeah for sure i don't know <laughs> you know it's you're still haunted by yeah. it. yeah I, I still hear him laughing in the trees you know I, I i pull into spots and like we would debate things all the time like what like uh the first show I ever did with him was a, a snook fishing show. It was in October and the water was high. The conditions were horrible. Windy. Couldn't even fly fish. And uh, we were throwing spinning rods. We were throwing this, you know, the, uh, the zoom lures, the, you know, the soft mm -hmm. plastic jerk right. baits. And he, you know, I'm on the back of the boat. I rig it up for him. Pulls up. He looks like this. He did it backwards. I said, no, that's how I do it. That's the right way. If you look at the package, they say you got to go through this way. The hook comes up and you skin hook it. I'm like, yeah, but now your hook point's exposed and now you're going to get caught in the trees. Okay. Flicks a cast right in there, twitch, 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 gets snagged in the tree. <laughs> and you know Jose. You know, he, he just kind of stands on the front boat. You see the shoulders drop. You just turn around that, that giggle. Is, right, right, you know? right. And I remember looking right at the boat, Mikey Terbicio, the guy yeah, used to sure. film him. And I remember looking right at the camera and saying, yeah, ladies and gentlemen, that's why we rig it the other way. You know? <laughs> and he would just start laughing, laughing you know, just one of the boys, you know. And, and yeah. I had a lot of good times with him. Yeah. He, he's the one that kind of, you know, got me into the boat that I run now. You know, he taught me how to be a little bit better in the business aspect of the guiding part. Mm -hmm. Taking chances, but, you know. Get a brand new boat. Even though yours is paid for and whatnot, get a brand new one. It's going to open your doors a little more. You go a little farther, a little faster. You know, remember one of the most important things he ever said. He goes, no matter how good you are, no, you know, all the good things that you do, no one remembers that. You do one thing bad, you, 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 know, you, you blow over somebody. That's what everybody remembers. You know, he, he's like, I've seen you as passionate as you are. I've seen you get fired up on the water, you know, people getting too close or whatever. He goes, just don't worry about it. Just move on and just do your thing. You know, you can't control them. All you can do is control yourself. You know, and it's a lesson I'm still trying to learn. I still bark. I still. But it does no good. It doesn't even make you feel better, does it? No. Not really. In a way, maybe it does. Briefly. Maybe. But that goes I, back to your you know, your your surfing background, your instincts. Yeah. You know, I listen to a lot of you know, my peers and my guides and I hear them bitching, you know, my poor buddies in the keys, you know. It's so overrun, 
you know, I, I hear guys waking up four in the morning, going anchoring around on points and like, you know, the guys who've been fishing there for decades, they can't even fish there anymore. You know, there's just mm -hmm. so much pressure on them and I hear people complaining, bitching and, and I'm like, well, do something about it. Speak up, you know, say something, maybe not in a derogatory way, but speak up to the guy, let him know. It's like, hey man, fish here every day. You know, I don't see you very often. Do you mind if I slide in here and fish with you? You know, and some people like it, some people don't. Right. Does anybody own a spot? No. But I think there's a there's a respect out there for guys who are doing it longer than you. Here's how I feel about that. I asked Steve Huff about this recently because on the internet, a lot of people are talking about owning spots. And Steve says, when you get there first and put your push pull on the, on the ocean's floor, you own that spot. Right. When you leave, it's no longer yours. In my world, that's cut and dry for me. There's a lot of gray. I can understand the negotiations with the gray as to how you can wiggle that that's wrong and I deserve to be here. And then Steve's, mindset and I hate to keep bringing his name up, but he's the voice of reason right. in, in our world. And to me, it's cut and dry. I have been on the water for 40 years down there. There are a lot of guides that, that I hold in such super regard. They've been there longer. They're better. Of course, I would never go into fish where they like to fish. But with that being said, there might be some young people that would be there first, even though they're not in the exact spot. It's not perfect. I would never go over and say, hey, man, you're fishing the wrong spot. This is my spot. Or you got to move. Unless I'm there first. If I'm there first and they come in and, and cut, try to cut us off, I'll say, I'll, we'll pull up, Nikki and I. I always say, look, it might serve both of us better if you pull up a little bit further or if you go over here and it'll all work out, I promise you. And in the past, I heard guys say, well, this is, nobody owns this ocean. Right. I'm going to fish where I want. Right conversation is ended right. but i personally i can't ever imagine asking somebody to leave or move because i've been doing this for 40 or 50 years or whatever right yeah it's a little weird though too because you're an angler you're not making a living out there and here's another thing you're in the keys you're speaking of the keys you're speaking of being out in the open in a bank where you can't hide i'm speaking of a country that's Filled 10,000 islands, coves, in and out, places you don't even right. know about unless you run by these coves. You don't see me in the cove. I hear you coming. I'm talking behind a limb. Right. You know what I mean? So if you see somebody and instead of thinking, I got 10,000 other places to fish, but you want to fish there, you feel entitled to go in and say, hey. No, I don't. Do I feel entitled? I don't think so. But I can say that. The way it's, it's it's intricate, everybody has, like, guys have these spots that they'll go on a routine that they've been fishing for years. They bounce around. It's not like sitting on a point, the fish are bouncing off a curve. It's a little lake. Right. And I just sneak in there. Now I have to pull around the chocolate water till I find the fish is not moving or, you know, laid up. Only one boat can do that. Right. Two boats. Not so if somebody comes in behind you, I understand. You know, but you were there first, right? Or I, I'm, I'm bad about this. I'm like a fish on a bed. <laughs> Sometimes I'll be fishing a spot, and there's just a little open to get in and out. And I'm kind of around the corner, you know. And I'll watch a boat go by, and you see his head turn, and the throttle comes off, and you sit, you see him watching you. It's like, hmm. I'll pull up binoculars and I'll look at the boat. I don't know that guy. He's watching me. The Maverick with the Mercury. I'll just go on my day. Tide's right again tomorrow. Wind's the same. I bet I could sneak in there and get those fish we left in that back corner we never touched. Here comes this guy in a Maverick with the Mercury. Hauling ass. Driving right over one flat to get into where I'm going. Right, no bueno. No bueno. Yeah, I man. get it. I get it. 
It's unbelievable how quiet the Everglades is. We don't have those big trade winds, you know, we're not battling the winds like you guys have. There's not that ambient noise. You're kind of in a closet, if you will. It's very tranquil. Yeah. You can be a mile over there and I can hear you go, look, there's Lagucky, the guy fish with those. Hey, they're tarpon fishing. Check that spot out later on. You can hear people saying this. Travel so far, you know. Yeah, I understand where you're coming. You from. know what I mean? I yeah, mean, I get it. it. It's I don't own the spot, but like if you go, like if, if, if let's say I I go into that spot and there's someone else already in there, he's there. Fine. I can't go in there. He's already moved around. He moved the fish or right. whatever. You know, he might pull different than I. He might be running a trolling motor, maybe even. Right. You know, I'm not going to go behind him. You know. But at the same time, I don't want to have to start racing this guy in there because this guy came in one day and saw you, and he saw this little gold mine that I have hidden back here right. that no one else fishes. You know, even when I'm not fishing this spot, I'll be driving by and I'll look. No one's in there. You know, it's different. You know, yeah. it's it's intimate because there's ten thousand islands, but there's not ten thousand tarpon spots. Right. You know what I mean? Yeah. There's only so many of them. It's a hard environment to tarp fish in. We don't get the chance to have that clear, visible water. Like, you know, to see a fish enter a place, come in, get comfortable, feed, and leave. You know, that's I, a cool statement right there. It, it's it's different. It, I say it all the time. If I could only just one time have my Everglades crystal clear, so I can watch the fish come in and go out, just mm -hmm. to learn. Because all I get is I see, all right, there's fish in here. He rolls here, goes down, there's a bubble. A couple minutes later, he rolls over here, there's a bubble. He rolls back over there. Okay, so he must be coming in, must be going like this. I think he's going out like that. It takes so much time to get in there and to figure out just by, you know, trial and error, just watching how they move. And I mean, sometimes there's a 150 pound fish 20 feet from the gun and you can't see anything but a pink tail. And it's two and a half foot of water. Cool. Like Jose would say, like, which side's the head, which side's the tail? Mm -hmm. He's staring right there at him. And it's just hard to see, you know? So it, it it's an intimate game. It takes so much. So it's kind of, you kind of get protective mm -hmm. of your spots once you put in all this time, incoming, outgoing, low tide, high tide, you know? Yeah, you explained that very, very, very well. I ask everyone this, but do you find new spots regularly? Often, yes. So, regularly, every day. Really? Yeah. So you're looking at new I'm spots I'm always every looking day. at something new. It's changing. You know, there's a lot of pressure. How successful are you to find fish in those new spots? Not as successful as I like to say. Right. Because once again, it's the visibility aspect. Right. Can I see there? And are they there? And I don't even know it. They may be. You know? Right. Is there a possible way for me to catch them? Or are they just blowing out underneath my boat? Right. Making big muds. Does side scanners, side scanner I ask that work question in the all mud? the time. I wonder. I don't know myself. I ask the guys who have them. Does it work in I think they do. Water? I think they probably would. You know? But is that fair? Okay. Let's just go into the ethics part of okay. fishing. Okay. No. But as a businessman... As a, as I'm gonna use uh, a, a fellow buddy of mine, he does like the the bay boat mm -hmm. bait fishing, catches the tarpon off the beach. But you know, this is you know from Indiana, right? He's gonna throw a thread fin and a cork in front of his fish. But there's times when they're running that 12, 15 foot of water just running down. You can't see. You never see it. And he'd yeah. be like, dude, psh, there's a hundred right here. Okay, I throw my cork out there. They got him. Right. How many tarpon did you catch today? Okay. <laughs> I threw it one. Yeah, it's totally different. Would it work in in the shallows? I don't know. Do I think it's ethical? No way. Right. I don't like the drones. Terrible. I'll see it right here on Millhouse and say it. Terrible. Cheater chopper. It is. Well, I feel that the water is the only camouflage and the ability to hide from us. And it's if everybody had drones and everybody had... Um, well, let's just say that 
to start with. Where are they going to hide? That's the whole thing. And like you said with Craig Brewer's podcast we did, he said in 20 years, you're not going to be able to catch a fish with a push pole because yeah. of all the pressure in the shallow water. They can't ever get comfortable because of boat pressure. And now you have everybody's got drones flying. I think they should outlaw them. I think the fishing game should come in and say it is banned to fish with drones because they do it in hunting. It, they do, and they do it in fishing too now. You know, I, look, like you want to go out with your boys and you want to get some killer dope ass shots, you know, the fish laid up and everything. That's cool, you know, but the long story is if these fish don't get a chance to rest and hide, and we're playing this game and they lose every single day, they don't want to play anymore. They're gone. It's gone. You know? So then, so here's the problem. Where do you draw the line? Because if somebody wants to put the drone up for an hour just so we can catch one fish, where do you draw the limit? An hour? 10 minutes? You get your kids? Your commercial fishermen? I mean, look at the guys who are flying baits out and dropping it over the schools of tuna with the drones. You know? and, hel- and, and airplanes? <laughs> yeah. No, I get that. Well, let's go to a different place here for a second. You are fly only. Yes. And Nikki and I were speaking about this earlier. And I don't know how to how to express this. Anti IGFA legal tippets yes. leaders. And am I anti? No, I'm not anti. Well, I just didn't know how you felt about IGFA and how you fly fish. I how about this? I'm a hard working blue collar guy trying to get a guy who can't fish to catch a fish. Right. Okay. I get that. So in my environment, I'm trying to get this guy to cast into a shoe shoe size hole the, in the mangrove the to just to present the fly to the fish right nobody throws sidearm and skips flies underneath the trees that your anglers but that's what you got to do right so when i'm fishing redfish snook my leader's made strong enough to when he's stuck in the tree point pull you and i can pop it out. it out without having to go up and disturb the fish and whatnot yeah I got muddy, murky water. I can get away with, you know, like my typical leader for a nine weight and down is like 40, 30, 20 to like 30 or 40, whatever bite tip I'm going to use. Right. It, just for the purpose that I need to be able to pull it out of the tree. Sure. But you use 20 pound test for yes. your class? Mm-hmm. I'm surprised you use 20 yeah. and not 30. There's time, but yeah, you know, I, here's, here's, I, you know, I, I'm an IGFA guy. I know, I know. I, but, but by I listening don't, but, but to I'm the telling, podcast. But I'm telling you something. I don't fish IGFA all the time. Right. My tippets are never more than 16-pound test class because we fish tournaments. It's all 16. Right. But my my bite tippet. We have, a, we have a day shock tippet. We might have a longer shock tippet. So if you get a bite and it scrapes you know, the monofilament, you can tie another fly on real, you know, yeah. real quickly. We're not tournament fishing. We're not world record fishing. But right. we're within... You know, 20 and less, you know, with the class tippet. Sure. Just because we want to become better anglers. I get that. Yeah. I get that. You're on that level. You want to be the better anglers. Right. I don't have that guy. You don't. Right. And I get that. You know. So, you know, look, he, I am never going to condemn somebody well, for fishing, you know, not IGFA. Right. I don't. I get that. What I do have a little question with is people who may be fishing 30, 40, and say 60 pound right off the fly line. Right. I've been there. I've done it. Yeah. Done it. But the problem I have with that, and a lot of people don't understand, one is it's dangerous. If you wrap a fly line around a little finger and you mm-hmm. get 60 pound test, you might lose a finger. But as important as that is that all of a sudden you get a shark on your fish. Yes. You can't break that fish off. Yes. Now, you guys spoke of this on the podcast. And I remember Nikki talking about it. It really got me thinking about it this past season. And usually I'm that guy. My my leader's going 50 pound, 40 pound, 30 pound, 60. And we don't have problems with sharks here. Right. There's no hammerheads chasing our shark. We don't have to pop them you don't off. Have to break anything we off. don't have to break anything off. Right. I'm having the hell of a time getting Johnny Indiana over here. A to fish. land John <laughs> yeah. fish, you know, Johnny Indiana. That's what I'm gonna call so, you from now on. You know, I'm listening to Nikki, and I'm I'm like, okay, I get it. I know how strong 20 pounds. I know they can't break it. I know that they can't pull a hard enough. These guys don't know how to bend the rod. Right. This is what my guys look like most of the time. They're fighting their fish like this, breaking rods. 
what the rod's pointing this way and the fish is over here. Oh, yeah. And I tell him, like, look, if we were fist fighting, would you turn your back to me? I don't think you would. You know, but I mean. You're talking about these really guys completely, com- complete neophytes. This is 80% of my business, maybe more. Right. right. Okay. So, once again, I'm listening to Nikki and the 20 pounds. I'm like, you know what? One of these goombas are going to wrap line around their finger and they're going to cut their finger off because of my strong leader. So I'm like, all right, I'm going to break down. I'm going to put some 20, I'm get rid of the 30 pound section. I'm putting the 20 in there. I catch three or four fish and everyone pops a leader on the fall just by jumping down on the leader. And Drag's too pop. tight. Drag's too tight. Maybe it is. But I never had that problem before. Right. And these are guys, you know, we're, I'm sure you guys have seen my videos on Instagram. You can hear me in the back. I can't help myself with coaching strength. Bow, you know. Right. These guys don't know to bow. You know, their you right. know, the angles are all wrong. I think 30 is fine. You know, I just a little bit. I'm when I'm I'm really a little bit worried about people getting hurt. You and, know, and you know, it, you're right. And that's the whole reason I switched it up. You yeah. know, just for that reason alone. To, right. You know, so nobody loses a finger. But what's happening now is you're losing fish. And poor guys, you know, see go you back next, to the, see you go, next year. Sorry, go back to dude. the 30. But here's another thing, and I just mentioned this on a previous podcast. A lot of people say, well, I can catch my fish faster if, if I got 40 I'm glad pounds. Glad you brought this up. So what I tell everybody, and I've done this, I have studied this. You have f- five fly rods with your leader tied to a scale. You have 20-pound tests. 40, 60, and 100. And you have these guys blindfolded, so they don't know which leader they have, and it doesn't mm-hmm. not gonna, it's not going to matter anyway. And you have them stand back and pull as hard as they can. No one, unless they have an absolute straight rod and they're hanging onto the fly line, is going to be able to pull more than 20. If you go into a fish fighting scenario, Agreed. and you have a slight rod, bend in your rod, and you're trying to fight a fish, no one's going to pull harder than 20-pound test. Agreed. I don't think I've seen more than 18 pounds yet. And I'm using a boga grip. I put the fly on there and I say, okay, Cannot cupcake, do it. pull as hard as you can. Big 300 pound guy, someone like Bear. You seem shaking. Right. And I'm like, all right, cupcake, you're pulling two pounds. Get the heck out of here. I'm like, yeah. So that's no excuse. Angles, that's right? no excuse. So I'm glad you brought that up because like these are the moments where I'm like talking to you on the podcast in my car as I'm driving to Everglades City, you know. <laughs> About the, you know, like, okay, I get it. You know, good anglers, 20 pound bowing, they, they get all that done, you know, but you know, my leaders are stronger, you know, for my guy to be able to catch that fish. And then everything that I hear and I'm listening, it, once again, I, I feel like there's a big difference between the Everglades and the Keys. Yeah, the, the Keys has this great sheep flow a lot of water moves through you guys can swing your flies to tarpon in the current can't do that in the everglades there isn't that sheep flow Mm -hmm. my tarpon are a bunch of lazy couch potatoes they tire out quick they don't have that flowing oxygen water to keep them moving right the keys i'm blown away yeah you catch an ocean swimming fish they're throwing 300 yards of backing in the ocean yeah they're jumping 10 foot out of the water they don't do fish. that here. Yeah, that's so, why here's that's why you want to catch big fish on light tippet here. That's why I want to catch them fast. Yeah, the faster I get that fish to the boat, I feel in eighty degree water, the faster I can get them off. If I can break the leader off, I like that even better. Right, to where I don't have to touch the fish. Right, if I can pop him off and he swims away, he's good. Right, but I feel like you know I hear some of my predecessors, you know, they'd be like. Pfft. I turned my drag down. I let those people fight him for three hours. It's like, great, dude. That fish is dead. dead. You know what I mean? Right. I, I fished with Tosh Brown one time. The, he's the photographer, photographer yeah. from Texas. Phenomenal. He told me a story one time. He was doing an article in the Keys. And I think he was fishing with Doug Kilpatrick. And he had these great anglers on who were whipping fish quick, getting to the boat 20, 30 minutes. They get the fish, talk to jump in the water, and start filming underwater footage. And he said two out of the five fish that they hooked and released in 20 minutes, swam away, took a breath of air, 
swam about another hundred feet, went to the bottom, and rolled over. Tipped over. Really? I think it's lactic acid buildup. It's got to be. Over duration. But you if, know, you quick, train, if you catch them quickly, they're not going to have nearly. That's my mentality. Yeah. See, I think if I get them in quicker, I'm just going to subdue them so quick. I'm going to get him out. He's on his way. But here's the deal. I don't think in my scenario, I wouldn't catch a tarpon quicker on 40 pound than 20 pound. You won't. The thing is, is the thing is, is that some anglers, it might be mental for some angle, anglers. They might say, oh, I have 20 pound tests and not 40. I, I got to play careful. them a little longer. I got to be careful. But in reality, you can pull the exact same. Exactly. Yeah, exactly. I understand. Exactly. You yeah. know, you give them that, you know, that mindset. Like I'll tell them like, look, pull as hard as you want to. Right. You're not going to break anything. Why? They're, they're coming from the 6X and this and that. You know, like that. You, I got to tell people, you got to pull, pull, put a bit in the rod, please. You know, you got to pull on the fish. They come down here in the salt water. They don't have the current to keep the line tight. So they got to manage stripping to keep it tight if the fish doesn't run to the reel. But the tarpon, he's going to pull. You're going to feel him, you know. Like you said, as hard as you pull, you can only pull so hard. The biggest problem we have here is people don't know how to pull. This is a fact. Look, when you ask somebody to pull harder, what do they do? They, they lift. Up. They lift the, the rod right. higher. That's correct. All you're doing is bending a rod tip. You're stretching rubber band. The more you pull your rod up and down, all you're doing is taking out the flex of your rubber band, which is the tip of the rod. Because you're correct. Fly, because when you're close, your right. your fly line's not right. going to stretch. But all you're doing is just. You know, your rod tip is so weak, you're just bending the rod tip. And that's what I say, too. Like, look, don't you want to bend in the thick spot of the rod instead of that little thin part up top? That's mm -hmm. the power down there. Right. You know? Right. It, well, it, it's it's so funny because I listen to the podcast. I'm listening to my peers and the guys I look up to, you know, throughout the keys. And, and it, you know, your podcast is a barometer for me. You know, I'm kind of like an isolated guy. I, I keep to myself, but I listen to my peers and my pros and how they're doing it, you know, right. and I and balance off of that. For sure. You I know, mean, like this topic here, like I can remember listening in my car going, yeah, but I don't have Andy Mill in the front. I right. got Johnny Indiana, you know. So it's like, how can I translate this information to my guy in the front of my bow? Yes, come fishing a lot to and learn. And that's, how to bend yeah, it's rod. experience. Yeah. yeah. It's experience, you know but also, look, a lot of people, you can say, go practice your fly casting in the park. But unless you know what, how, how to fix what you're doing wrong, you're refining bad techniques. That's exactly right. You're developing bad habits. And you're refining bad habits. Right. It's like a, somebody who doesn't have any golf lessons and you go to the range to practice. What are you practicing? Right. Bad habits. Right. You have to understand the dynamics of what throws a fly line. And you know, you can't learn that until you come here. Or and you fish with somebody in, in that field right. of, you know, that region. You don't know until you go and see that. Well, also get on the internet yeah. and watch people teach fly casting. You know? And, and look and watch and then go do it. You know, learn how to accelerate that fly line. You don't hit it hard to throw a tailing loop. You build speed and then stop the rod. You build speed and stop it. Look on the internet and go practice. I, you know, I say it a thousand times a day. <laughs> I know. You know, it, it, you know what? Look, all the answers are out there. You just have to put the time in and find them. Right. You know, are you content with your casting? No. Get out there and cast again. Right. You know, your whole, your, look, your experience is only going to be as good as how well prepared you are to, to be out on that boat. I have a friend in Colorado that had begged me for years to come tarpon fishing. He's a good friend, and he's a professional trout guide. He, he rows a boat down the river. And I went and saw, oh, I took him to a park in March when I was out there skiing for a week, and he was going to come that June. Jim Hancock, we love you. <laughs> <laughs> no, Nicky. We love you, Jim. Hopefully he doesn't watch our podcast, but if he does, he knows what we're talking about. But I said, Jimmy, you have to understand a couple of things about building speed with your with your hauling hand and stopping the rod. Long story short, he never caught a fish because he couldn't get it more than twenty feet out of yeah. you know off out of the boat. And he ended up sticking a fly through his vein in his arm. He said, "Just pull it out." 
I said, really, just pull this fly out of your vein. <laughs> That's not. So here we are going to Key West, uh, urgent care, and the fish, the big daisy chains are yeah. still in the ocean. You know, I love, love, passionately love to teach people the game. I was taught, my, my father, he told me one day, you know, I came home, had a tough day, couldn't catch fish or anything. He goes, you know, it's out of your control whether those people can fish. It's out of your control what the weather's like. It's out of your control whether the fish bite or not. He goes, you know what, but the time you have them on your boat, teach them something. Give them something that they can learn. Give them something that's going to last longer than the eight hours on the day in the water with you. Give them that education that he can take home and he can apply to the bass in the stream at home or something like that you know and i just I, I get that proud coach feeling when i'm with my repeats who you know at first we couldn't cast we couldn't double haul we you know just couldn't fish and you know the years go by and i love the guys who just get ate up with it and they're going home they're sending me videos of practicing in the yard and this and that and then they come back you know the next year and they're a little bit better and i get that proud choked up coach feeling mm -hmm. you know i get that first tarpon you know or just the first fish you know when we're, we there wasn't even a chance in hell that we're gonna catch a fish today you know we might catch a ladyfish maybe you know but they're putting the time in and, and they listen and they call and they want to learn you can hear the questions that they ask and i want to go out of my way and i want to show them everything i can to make them better and as they do we become a good team Right. And fishing is easy mm -hmm. and it's so much fun. I mean, th th there's times when like, you know, I almost tear up sometimes. You know what I mean? It's like, man, we're working so hard with this guy, but he's, he's putting the time in, you know, and it's coming together. And then you have the, uh, the other guy that, you know, comes up, shakes your hand. He's like, huh, I haven't touched the rod since I saw you last year. Proud and being proud of it. Huh, awesome. We're going to have a great time tomorrow, you know, <laughs> but I, I, I love it. You know, it, I, I have a thousand different analogies to tell you the same thing. Right. Like as a guide, I have to right. come up with that analogy. Certain of, words don't work. The sharp stop, the thumb behind, you know, the fulcrum, the catapult, you know, hey, you're jumping your yo-yo, you know? Well, what do you mean I'm jumping my yo-yo? Well, haven't you ever played a yo-yo and, you know, if it doesn't go all the way down, it never comes all the way up. Well, every time when you make that cast and it falls backwards because you jumped your back cast. That's a good analogy. Yeah. You know, another thing, you know, for us, like your grandfather tells you when you learn how to drive a boat, now look, you approach the dock as fast as you want to run into the dock. <laughs> oh, so when you run into it, it doesn't hurt so bad if you're going slow, right? So as I'm learning to cast into the mangroves and these little holes, I've come to realize that if I can slow my cast down, I could watch that slow loop go right into that hole and I can manipulate a little bit of my fingers and drop it right in, you know? And you get the guys who come in and they're just rifling. Let's say you get Johnny Striper, you know? Johnny Striper. Johnny Striper, <laughs> you know? <laughs> There's three casters in the world, fly fishermen. You got the trout guys. Okay, they're phenomenal. They got to get the drag free. You know, it's all about the drift and getting that to drift just perfect to present to the trout. And you got the Northeast guys. There's a pile of bluefish out there just frenzying all the bunker out there. It's just a mass of boiling water. Just chuck out 150 feet on an intermediate line. It doesn't matter if it collapses. It doesn't matter if it, you know, goes left, right, falls 10 feet short. They just start stripping. The yeah. Massive fish, they catch fish. Then you come down to Florida. You got these flats guys. They're the placers. You gotta place our fly right here. You know, I have to feed this fish. I, I have to place my fly right here so it swings in front of this fish that's feeding on the bottom and he's gonna eat it. You know, and target shooting. Target shooting. Mm -hmm. If I can slow it down, I could probably put it right on that that dinner plate. If I rifle it and I try slowing it down a little bit, there's so much speed it recoils. And bounces it loses, back. It bounces back, right. exactly. You know? So I love taking those steps and 
making that transition between the trout guy with the, the delicate open loop soft presentation cast to the striper guy who's just trying to make a hundred foot cast in, in a 50 foot shot you know where he shoots right. it so far through the mangroves like you almost got to climb out of the boat to see the fly you know <laughs> Just getting them to slow down, and it becomes easier to become, become more accurate. Right. You know? For sure. Well, talking to your wife, she seems like quite the Passionate. quite the fisherman or ate, fisherwoman. Uh, she's ate up with it. Did you did you get her into fly fishing? Yes. That's how she picked me up. Is that right? Yes. No, she yes. saw the surfer <laughs> blonde hair. No, no, no. It was totally the opposite. I'm walking up to the pier just to look at the water, and there's this beautiful girl in like in a black bikini walking by, and she just happens to look up and say hello. And you said you want to go drink some Dom. <laughs> Something like that. I think it's more the Pilar, you know? <laughs> but, uh, you know, we grew up in the same cliques, you know, the same group of people. We lived, you know, amongst each other. But our paths never crossed. And it, she found out who I was and I found out who she was. We just started talking. And the first thing she said is like, well, I heard you're a fly fishing guide. I would love to learn how to fly fish. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, right. I ain't passing this <laughs> up, you know. <laughs> and that's kind of how it started. And the funny thing is Christina's allergic to seafood. She can't touch a fish. She can't. I mean, I can't eat seafood and give her a kiss without her reacting. Wow. So, you know, we're first dating, you know, she's catching a fish and she wants a picture for Instagram. I'm breaking out like the Muppet mittens, you know, the carpet gloves. <laughs> the oven gloves. You, you, you know, so she doesn't break out or whatever, you know. You gotta take your elk hunting. <laughs> That's next, you know. She couldn't kill an animal, you know, but uh, well, she's ate up with the fly fishing now. Oh, I that's mean, cool. so much to the fact that where, I work so much, I don't get the chance to take her out anymore to where she went out this year and she bought her own Ginu. I see that. So she's going out on her own. She's trying to learn how to pole the boat. That's awesome. It's it's incredible. And I, once again, I'm getting that proud feeling, you know, my wife's out there, she's sight fishing. She's on her own. She's pulling a Ginu, she's dropping an anchor. She's sight casting to a snook. You and know? she's catching them. She's catching them. Good Very for you, cool. you know? No, I'm pretty lucky. I'm blessed. How what? would you? How would you like? What would you like to end this with? What would you like to say to our audience? Whatever it might be. Enjoy the moment out there. Take it in as much as you can. It's beautiful. It's gorgeous. Appreciate those moments, you know. It's it's uh it's still a perfect world out there. You still come across those moments. It's just heaven sent. You might have to work for it time to time, but you'll see it. It's there. It's there. It's magic. You know. And I think that's why so many people have grown to this sport. You can't you can't get mad at them for it. You know, yeah. I mean, they love it as much as we do, right? We just might be a little selfish. <laughs> we were doing it for a long time. You know, it's not new to us, but we don't, we don't ever want it to stop, right? You know, it, it, I, it, it's, I, it's, it's, it's a phenomenal world that we live in. Yeah, you know, and there's a lot of crazy stuff going on, but man, it, it's out there. It'll refresh your soul. Nature's the key. Go live it. Go live it because it's there's not a lot of it, you know. Yeah. Find those spaces. Whether you're chasing down an elk, he's blowing snot in your face, you know, before you release your arrow. Yeah, you know, it's exciting. Whatever it takes. You your know? heart's pumping. It's great. It's that heart pumping. Yeah. No great. better place. It's great hanging with you, Jeff. I've always enjoyed your company at the shows, and whenever I see you on the docks, you've got that. Uh, You've got that presence and the energy and the uh, the electricity that people gravitate to you, and I'm one of those. Thank you. Yeah, I'm, no, I'm completely flattered. I, I am completely honored to be here. As we are, I am grateful. Thank you so much. Thank well, you. It was great to meet you, yeah. Jeff. Pleasure. I've been wanting to meet you for a while, so thanks, brother. Thank you very much. Well, You're so welcome. It's just a story. Well, so it's just a